Welcome to the New Process Podcast. Learn all the tools, methods, and best practices combined with people, emotions, and a a human-centric mindset to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Uh, And here here is your host, Marco Kloppenberg. Yeah, welcome to episode 33 of the New Process Podcast. Today, it's all about change and transformation in complex organizations. And as it turned out during the interview, it's also a little bit about process mining. So today I'm talking to Jia T. Nguyen. T is currently working at SAP in Singapore as vice president for SAP Signavio's market impact in Asia. Before that, he worked for nearly 20 years in various roles at Siemens. To highlight and summarize, he worked in six countries with various functions from being a CIO in Vietnam, implementing SAP for a company and plan that was set up in parallel for restructuring and turning around acquired companies in Spain as the CFO. And he also led as the global head of operational excellence for Siemens Digital Industries, change on a large scale by kickstarting Siemens process mining journey with the introduction of a digital twin of the organization. So we'll learn more about that in the interview. He enjoys supporting the Plastic Bank and is also on the board of the German nonprofit organization of the Plastic Bank Foundation. T has also a really cool LinkedIn video series called T with T about digital transformation, which is quite entertaining and interesting at the same time. So if you haven't listened to that up to now, you have to. I'll put the link into the show notes later on. What is in for you today, you'll learn how to get all the people on board for transformations, including T's recommendations to process owners to get people on board for complex change projects and what to take into account in complex organizations. We'll have a follow-up on the previous episode with Will van der Alst, and we're going to talk about T's experiences in introducing process mining at Siemens, especially with regards to different countries and cultures. So. Enjoy the interview with T. And now, let's start to rethink processes. Yeah, welcome to the New Process Podcast, T. It's great to have you here today. Today, it's not T with T. It's just a conversation between you and me. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome, T. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. So, let's dive right into the check-in. Uh, what do you prefer in an aircraft, aisle or window seat? It depends. On a short-term, short-time flights uh, window. On long haul, definitely aisle seat. Yeah, okay, short time window. That, that's good. I was flying uh, from Stuttgart to Hamburg yesterday and I also had a window seat. And it was beautiful to see Hamburg in the afternoon. Yeah, that, that was great. Also, Stuttgart was nice. <laughs> okay, what, what is your favorite airport? I think I don't have actually a single one favorite airport. I think every airport has its charm. But if I have to give you, let's say, three airports uh, I do like, uh, Changi, yeah. of course, in Singapore. Absolutely okay. efficient immigration. I never take more than uh, two minutes, to be honest. Really? That's uh, cool. I also love uh, the old uh, Berlin Tegel Otto Lilienthal because this is where I was born and grew up. But each and every gate had their own luggage conveyor. So you never needed to look, where's your luggage? It's just there, right? It was that small back in the days. <laughs> and I do also love uh, Nuremberg for its very, let's say, compact size. Yeah. And it has a direct metro access to it. But I mean metro at the same price as if you would go anywhere. So that was actually my three. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I also like Nuremberg, but I only got a rental car there. So <laughs> never tried public transportation in Nuremberg before. But we'll see. Cool. So what was the best process you have ever experienced? Well, this is it's a, it's a tough question, but if... I think of one I, I really, let's say, rem- remember very yeah. well is probably a customer success process in online gaming where you play with real money. And right. the reason is that they want the best of you, which is uh, our money. So therefore, anytime I had any engagement, I had the necessary amount of automation, but also the necessary amount of human interaction And when it got heated up, I got money. So really, literally, like I escalated a a topic. A person called me and said, you don't know who I am, but you will get money. Okay. $100 credited to your account. Yeah. So they really know how to to deal with the the customer. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, that sounds good. And it was a real person who called you, yeah? <laughs> not a computer. That's correct. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. So let's get closer to the topic uh, of today, uh, of processes. Um, how would you describe your relationship to processes? Well, I think actually my relationship to processes is actually quite common and similar to everyone, which basically means, you know, I'm a 40 years old. So I, my relationship with processes is 40 years, meaning everyone is experiencing processes. And when we talk about, let's say, the practice of business process management, of course, then my former job has brought me into that realm, let's say, really from the beginning of my career, so over 20 years ago. But I think it's really a, a hate-love relationship in a very positive and optimistic uh, point of view, because I have never seen a person who likes a bad process. Okay, And I think this is something really humbling and uh, also something that connects us, that even if I can't change the past of having experienced bad processes, I still get a lot of, let's say, also gratification, satisfaction of improving it for other people to experience. Uh, so for me, it's okay. You know, the, the, the ship has sailed, the train has passed. But I think processes are everywhere. Processes affect everyone. No one likes a bad process. And I think that's uh, my relationship with processes in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. And I already introduced you uh, as vice president for SAP's Signavio's market impact in the Asia, Pacific, Japan, and greater China region. Is that correct? That is uh, correct, yes. And uh, market impact is actually quite easily to be described. Basically, it's, uh, uh, it's part of our marketing activities. Yeah. And marketing okay. really entails all aspects of marketing, whether it's product marketing, field marketing, all the events, the communication. But it also includes the evangelization and the thought leadership around the value proposition. Really, from the beginning to the end, you know, it's also about the demand generation. It's about enablement, internal, external. So it's a, it's a very wide uh, range. And uh, that's why we are also a very, very diverse team of very, very different kind of experiences. And uh, that makes it uh, very exciting. Yeah. yeah, okay, I can imagine. Before joining SAP, uh, SAP, you headed various transformation projects within Siemens. Which one was the most challenging there? Let me try to give you a little bit of a complex answer, but I keep it simple. Hopefully. Okay. I think the, the most challenging project is always the next one. <laughs> and the most challenging while I'm experiencing it is the current one. Okay, Because I think that every situation has different kinds of challenges. And uh, let me just share maybe like two, three different uh, transformation projects I did and why they were challenging in their own way. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in 2005, I was implementing SAP ERP in Vietnam. Yeah, so Siemens Vietnam at that time had uh, uh, no ERP solution. And then we basically implemented the whole thing, you know, FICO, SD, MM, and PP, even the production. We, we set up a new mm -hmm. factory. And you have to imagine, like, uh, we, we implemented it, uh, hired new people, and then really went from Big Bang with no legacy, no history, to full-blown SAP ERP implementation. And so that was quite challenging. And uh, yeah, I was a CIO at that time, and I had zero experience of hardware or of anything. And so that was actually pretty, pretty big challenge because I come from the application arena, but I was also having to buy printers and things like that. There was no cloud at that time. Another one was in, in Spain, 2010, you know. So uh, if you remember, uh, I hope you can forget, but in 2010, Spain, you know, Italy, Portugal went through a very uh, long uh, economic mm -hmm. crisis. And I was the CFO of a, a Siemens affiliated company, and I had to really lay off over 70% of the entire workforce. So we went through a major restructuring. And then again, zero Spanish skills when I arrived, zero CFO skills. I have never worked in my life in accounting controlling before. That. So I really come from an IT background, always focusing on processes. Yes, that's true. But yeah, that, that was, yeah. And probably the last really big challenge was during Corona, everyone left Vietnam, you know, every, sorry, every foreign expat left Vietnam, I went in. Yeah, so I was literally on a consular airplane because already no one was allowed to come in. And I worked in healthcare. So I led a team of around 80 people in service. I led the service business of Siemens Healthcare. Again, mm -hmm. 
zero percent experience in healthcare. I never had a, luckily, I never even knew what a CT is in my life. Yeah, I, I never seen one live. You know, I see it in the pictures. But to really understand what's the difference between a MRI, a CT, a X-ray, it's, it's very humbling to be able to learn these things. And yeah, so these are three examples of, of big transformation topics on an internal level, but also externally. We had to do quite a lot of things. You can imagine COVID time service, how to keep operations running, and then yeah. at the same time pushing healthcare 4.0. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, that's that's super interesting. And you know, I'm fighting a lot for a human centric BPM approach. In all these complex change processes you were leading, how did you manage to get the people excited, to get them on board, to involve them? What was the, the trick there, the recipe? I think there's really not a trick or a recipe there, but uh, if I go, let's say, quotes on quotes, on the lessons learned aspect. Yeah. I think this is really not a big secret. People do like authentic people, and they like to be able to trust someone. But also in order to be able to trust somebody, there are different things you can do. And to be honest, uh, the first thing we can do is to listen. And again, when I mentioned, you're like, how would you feel if you have been working in a, in a factory for many, many years, and then you get a new boss, he's the CFO, and you, let's say, for example, you have a head of accounting controlling, and you find out this guy is, I don't know, 15 years uh, younger than you, has never worked in finance, and now he is supposed to do this major restructuring. Mm -hmm. What can I do? Can I say, this is a strategy, this is what we have to do together is better? No, of course not. The first thing I do is to listen and ask better questions. Yeah, and then by that, then the people will know, okay, that's how to do it. So how to get all the people excited or happy is, of course, a very, very noble vision or something we could be looking forward to. But it's impossible because somebody who really wants to make everyone happy will actually make everyone unhappy. And honestly, it is actually a very, very transparent and fair thing to say from the beginning, I will not make everyone happy, mm -hmm. but I will want to make at least 80% happy and 20% of my effort. And I will still take 80% of my effort to do my best for the last 20% where possible. And please raise your hand and help me on achieving that. And then actually things do work. And if you talk about, let's say, are you interested in the products? Are you interested in my customers? Are you interested in suppliers? That's what I did. You know, every day I go onto the shop floor and I want to understand. And I don't ask stupid questions, trivia, and then just I never come back there. But I ask, hey, yesterday you told me about work in progress. These are the crates. Why are they still here? What mm -hmm. happens to my supply chain? You know, and then people actually understand, oh, this person actually really means it when he is asking, how does the flow of goods on the factory shop floor, for example, work? And then if you get the acceptance mm -hmm. on the shop floor, but also in the boardroom, then People will trust you. And then you can also talk about other things, quotes and quotes, other things, meaning about processes. Yeah. And I think, and I will probably mention this quite a lot of times, so this is the spoiler alert. <laughs> If you want to achieve anything, don't talk about it. If you want to lead a human-centric transformation, don't talk about I'm for humans. If you're not for humans, what are you for then? Yeah. So the thing is that they will come to that conclusion that you are indeed human-centric. So that's why you don't need to mention it. Mm -hmm. If I want to improve processes, you know what I always said? I'm not here to improve your processes. You are already improving your processes the best way you can and know. My job is to help you on the how to do what you're doing anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I'm not here to tell you how to do it differently. I'm just here to listen, to understand how things are there and this. And if you call it process, if you call it cooking, if you call it playing the violin, That's all related to a process, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It is, for sure. Okay. That's a, a good approach, I'd say. And um, transferring that even more to processes. So let's imagine I'm process owner uh, of a bigger process uh, and there is a transformation coming up. What would you recommend to me on how to approach the people, how to get them involved? more specific with regards to processes? I mean, probably uh, too long for a podcast so we can actually split the podcast. But <laughs> I, think, I think there's really way too many things there. And there's really, unfortunately, also, let's say, this kind of instant gratification approach often to think, you know, what's my cookbook recipe? What are the top 10? What are the top three? What are the most common things? And of course, they are all relevant. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not going to 
be uh, saying that uh, they are not important. But what I really believe is that the most important thing is actually to listen and then to really shape based on your experience, based on different kind of patterns, their own personalized, let's say, recommendations. Mm -hmm. But if we are, let's say, using my experience on, on, a, on a scale, of course, there are the, the, the common themes around uh, starting small and then scale, you know. I also talk a lot about this so-called concept of, you know, like when you have moving targets, that's, that's child's play. That's easy because everyone will have this challenge. What yeah. I'm talking about is moving baselines. That's even worse. They're mm -hmm. actually moving the foundation on where you stand. They're saying you're spending X amount. You need to save 20%. Tomorrow, they actually say, oh, you actually spend that amount. You need to save Y. Whoa, you just changed the baseline. That is actually something which is really a thing. The other thing is like, for example, don't focus too much on the targets. Focus on the triggering events to move toward the target because mm -hmm. then the target is just a target. I always say, you know, I'm, a, I'm a finance guy. I said, can you improve the EBIT? Of course you cannot. Whoever told you you can improve EBIT is a liar. You can improve your top line, your revenues, mm -hmm. and you can improve the cost position. And then the resulting thing is called EBIT. Yeah, so you, we, we should look at the other things. Yeah. So that's why, you know, focus, don't focus too much on the targets, but understand how the targets are influenced. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about having a compass and a map. Yeah, because if you have a map, but you don't know which way to read it, then it's also not worth it. So sometimes you just need a compass, you know, the directions, okay? Yeah. Even if you go left or right and, and no one talked about it, you know? What else? Uh, resistance to change. Honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't buy this stuff. <laughs> there is no resistance to change. The resistance to change is really the greatest library of knowledge. Talk to these people. Ask them, why are you resistant? Because probably you wanted to change, but somebody else wasn't listening. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're resistant to change because you can't deal with the same BS force fed into you and that's why they're resistant to change otherwise no one is resistant to change i told you like everyone loves a good process mm -hmm. and also even everyone well not everyone most of the people would also sacrifice their own process that somebody else has a good process if they really see it if everyone yeah. are just talking oh you need to take the the bullet for the team no they're not but if they see that you know so yeah it's i mean I, i'm plugging a lot of my t with t episodes here sorry about that but <laughs> really, if we look for the secret sauce, it's a hard to swallow pill. There is none. And I also talk a lot about this so-called content as king, context as King Kong. Yeah? And uh, this is something what is really important. And maybe to make, if, if I have to, now sorry for an elaborate answer, but if I have to, to pinpoint on one thing I can recommend process owners to do, contact me. We have a tea with tea. I talk, I will listen. And let's see if I can help you. Yeah, that's probably the first <laughs> thing. And if I cannot, then at least I confirm that they are on the right track, right? I mean, it's yeah. also a good thing. So yeah. I am what I share. And, and uh, that's basically maybe the number one uh, thing I can recommend. <laughs> yeah, I, I listened to two of your videos this morning because they were presented, I don't know why, uh, in my stream today on LinkedIn. And they really gave me food for thought. So uh, one was about eine Sau durchs Dorf treiben. I don't know. Okay. Uh, have a new Drive bus the south thing in the village, whatever yeah, it is. <laughs> exactly. And it's really inspiring. So to, to watch your T with T videos there. And I think conversation with you is always great as, as we're having here right now, but I want to push it one step further. So you are now coming from, I would say slightly complex organizations like Siemens. You're working for SAP right now. I've been working for Lufthansa Group which definitely is sometimes a little bit complex. What would you recommend for environments like these, very complex organizations with regards to change, in addition to what you just said? I always say that, you know, systems, tools, platforms, technology is, uh, is very complex, and that's true. But uh, only people have a capability to be complicated. Because even in the most complex system, with the extreme rare frequent uh, a byte swaps, yeah, but that's a totally different topic uh, <laughs> of physics and science. But usually, whatever comes in always will be reproducible, come out the same way, you know, if, if it is about technology systems. But people know, yeah, sometimes it's a mm -hmm. good day, sometimes it's a bad day. Yeah? You can ask me, T, what's the time? I said, to tell you the time. Uh, you ask me tomorrow, what's the time? I said, what do you want from me? Right? Yeah. So people are complicated. So yes, again, you know, listen to the kind of the power 
movements but power flows and I don't mean power like in a bad way yeah but really you know power is flowing understanding how power is exerted how is it shown you know I think there's uh, something really cool uh, called the cultural web from Scholes and Johnson I think it's called so there's a different kind of aspects on how a culture is being built you know there's mm -hmm. uh, six different aspects you know organizational they talk about symbols and things like that and I think what is really exciting is about me, uh, and it has a, a peculiar experience because I don't get nervous anymore. You know, when I have a big speech or things like that. And the reason is because I have been trained from very, very young age to deliver performances, whether it's musical, whether it's athletic. And then I also had the chance to do a lot of public speaking. And so I think Simon Sinek actually put it very well. He said, like, you know, Olympic athletes, they, they try to get excited. They're not nervous. Mm -hmm. So it is really the, 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 the positive part of it. And that's basically what is also my recommendation. The bigger the challenge, the higher the complexity, try to, sorry, piss in your pants, but only once. <laughs> and then afterwards, get excited. Yeah. When you get excited, to draw the line, to say, and not worse, from here, this is the worst we have ever been. From now on, yeah. I think that's a really exciting thing. Yeah? And I think this is something I, I understand, you know, like you can think about being focused or is it a tunnel vision, you know, and to be honest, I think in, in large organizations, the problematic is not the complexity because the complexity is a fact that is there anyhow. I think it's much more about some people's relationship reality to mm -hmm. accept what is a reality and also the hubris in addressing topics. Mm -hmm. So I really believe in a complex organization, if you have the quotes and quotes crazy people, to me, those are the no most normal things mm -hmm. in people because they want it to be in a different way. So that's why for us, we always talked about, and I hate the word, yeah, but we always talk about new normal. Yeah. But now it seems to be looking backwards, looking forward. It seems so far away. I mean, you have been probably also trying to make a video call with net meeting and typing in the IP, and then somebody says, "Oh, the port is not opened." Right back in the days. Yep. Now we do podcasts, video, yep. no problem, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I think in most complex, just the attitude towards it uh, matters a lot. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's so true. I can fully agree to what you just said. And you just mentioned uh, the word new normal. In the previous episode, I was talking to Will van der Aals about process mining. And there he said uh, he hopes that process mining is going to be the new normal so that all companies just have it there as a tool to improve processes. You've been a process mining pioneer, I would say, at uh, Siemens. So you introduced process mining there. I was working on the same within the Lufthansa group. And there, my biggest challenge in the beginning has always been how to convince the top management on investing into process mining technology because it's not new normal or it's not normal uh, or it wasn't normal at that time. And it still isn't, I guess. But how do you, did you convince your management to invest into process mining? To be absolutely uh, transparent and fair, I actually had a little bit of tailwind there. Okay. Because uh, Lars Reinkemeyer, you know, a good old friend, now working for the competition, but still my friend. <laughs> <laughs> He already set the foundation in terms of the IT environment. Okay. So basically, he already pushed for a corporate service, meaning that me, as a business owner, could actually utilize. So he already did the upward battle to say, We should invest it. So he actually did it really on behalf of the business itself. Okay. okay. But it is true. The, the question is still very valid because we needed to continuously show value in order to get any additional invest. Yeah. So often it's very hard to get the first invest. Absolutely agree. But sometimes the second invest is even harder because it's much bigger. <laughs> yeah. And the people want to see the value, right? So let's talk about, let's say, quotes and quotes, the second invest. And again, in order for the top management to invest in process mining is to not talk about process mining, but to talk about outputs. Mm -hmm. And I think it is really, really important to understand that even as the largest process mining user at that time, Siemens had zero benefits realized by just using process mining. Yeah. We uncover with the analysis different things we had to do 
But these actions, these actions were what? Cleaning up master data, mm -hmm. adjusting, customizing, tweaking ABAPs, talking to people, asking if I put in this activity to you, we have one less handover and therefore also less variations. And you can take that and I will increase, for example, the threshold of you to approve. Then mm -hmm. we don't have all of this ping ponging around. You know, I think these are the things we need to address because the technology itself, of course, does not give you the value, but it's basically the technology shows you where the value is and then you still have to do the work. But obviously, you have a higher confidence to know where to work and where to address these things. And there's actually one funny correlation was that actually we were somehow also tracking the usage of process mining by country by country. Mm -hmm. And we saw that the countries who use process mining the most in terms of time actually improved the least. Don't get me wrong, like all countries improved and yeah. we're very happy about it. But the rate of improvement was actually slower in comparison to other countries when they just used it too much. And why? Because they stared at the screen for 20 hours and said, oh, I have to improve. And they didn't do it. <laughs> Other countries, they said very clearly, let's do it continuously once a month, two times a month. We look at it and then we look at it again and we see improvements because we know that the hard work is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But it's also fair to say it's very hard if you didn't have these kind of tools because you could not otherwise ask these kind of questions. Yeah. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I was a CFO, so I also use CFO tricks to also uh, make sure that we would get the investments. Just a spoiler, I'm also a um, certified Scrum Master and Agile Coach plus CFO. So I therefore then said we must also do ROIs and sprints. So sprints is, of course, always smaller than the yearly budget cycle. Yeah. And there is not one executive who would actually deny you to, let's say, go against the initial plan if you get more value with no additional net investment. Mm -hmm. So what it means in the language of a CFO, there's a cost base. And with the therein cost already approved, I would just reshift some things. So nothing will be added new. Mm -hmm. But the benefits we have planned, let's say 7%, I will give you now 11 mm -hmm. No one will say, no, you can't do that. And that's basically what you need to do. You need to deliver value fast because speed becomes a currency by itself. It becomes a category by itself. Yeah, I'm not saying that everything what is fast is better. But what I'm trying to say is that we talk about things like resistance to change and stuff like that. Well, it also increases if you are too slow because it also decreases your authenticity. It decreases the confidence other people have in you, the trust. Mm -hmm. So therefore, speed is also very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you just mentioned that you executed process mining projects in different countries. What was, were the differences you experienced there with regards to the cultures of the countries? Where was it easier to apply process mining and where was it harder to do it? Something, you, of course, you cannot know. Is, but um, on, on an average, I also uh, mentor and advise around 20 to 30 uh, bachelor, masters and PhD. Mm -hmm. Books. And this is the most common question. There's always some bachelor or master's pieces around the difference of process mining, country A and B, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. And I find this question extremely, extremely interesting, to be honest, because I don't think that a particular technology would be so different in a country. So it might be true that maybe QR code adoption is much faster in China versus in Germany or that the use of robots in Japan in a hotel is much easier to use than in, in the Netherlands or something like that. I don't know. Maybe there is some. some mm -hmm. But when it comes to process mining implementation, there was really no difference in terms of the aspect of the technology itself when it comes to transparency. But there was obviously a, a, a difference in terms of the maturity, in terms of the output metrics. Mm -hmm. which were, let's say, our, our targeted. Yeah, We had the so-called digital fit rate, which basically measured the numbers of manual interactions end-to-end -end in the order-to-cash process. Mm -hmm. And so basically, uh, manual interactions, the lower, the better. So we basically saw that some countries were really, really good having very, very low digital fit rates. And basically, so if you're below one, 
it basically means that a number of your order line items are totally invisible to the organization because they went in and out totally automated. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No interaction whatsoever mm -hmm. across all the steps, not only one step, all the steps. So that maturity was totally different. So therefore, in different countries, they had different focus areas in terms of, let's say, increasing automation. Mm -hmm. Other countries had to focus on reducing manual rework. Other countries had to do baseline and, and, and create good models or standardizations first. Yeah? So that definitely uh, changed. But also, uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, and uh, I know you haven't asked it, but I think it's associated to it, is it's just a language topic. If I go to the U.S. and talk about BPM, they say, I don't care about processes, I care about outcomes. If I go to uh, Germany or the Netherlands and talk about processes, we have a really cool discussion about process, very mature. Mm -hmm. If I go to, I don't know, Japan, talk about processes, they say, oh, I'm not process driven. All of this is just a language matter. Mm -hmm. The father of a homeland of quality management of, of both Kaizen and of all of these topics, Muda Muda, eh? of waste, comes from Japan. So just talk their language. Mm -hmm. Talk the language of what it means to be process management. Mm -hmm. In the US, of course, talk hammer. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the re-engineering. That's also process. So just a, it's an it's a issue of, of, of positioning. So therefore, of course, process mining is, quotes and quotes, easier to position because there is no legacy and there's no bad experience to it being quotes and quotes sluggish. Yeah. And that is probably the bad rap about BPM. Process mining, of course, has this uplift uh, as being something totally new. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in the beginning, I think the people where you introduced process mining did not know what that really is. So uh, maybe they thought, ah, now you're going to analyze my performance and I don't want to participate in the project. How did you get the people excited about process mining? Maybe it's important to understand that um, I was never in charge of process mining uh, okay. or I didn't, let's say, implement it. A process mining was just a small slice of my overall portfolio yeah. of uh, responsibility. So I was the global order to cash process owner responsible mm -hmm. for Siemens Digital Industries. And Later on, then I also was uh, in charge of offer to order, which is a totally different game. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we talk about CPQ, you know, configure price quotation, things like that. And I was also the global pricing manager as well. So I had a multitude of things. Mm -hmm. The implementation of process mining was, of course, a very visible one. Yeah? Absolutely true. But at the same time, I also had to set up chat service centers in uh, Bulgaria, and Poland, mm -hmm. and in Portugal, for example. So we had also major restructuring topics. So, you know, I had some past in, the, in Spain, yeah, so that's why I know how to do restructuring. So, therefore, when I appear in front of my local stakeholders, we talk about outcomes. We talk about the reduction of preventable manual rework. Mm -hmm. We talk about customer NPS. We talk about yeah, standardization, uh, cycle times, and things like that. And that we did through process mining, RPAs, mm -hmm. workflows, and other things. Yeah? So I think this is really important to understand. You need to have the full stack out there and then you know, just a small pitch. That's why I'm at SAP Signavio because we do all of these things. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is really the important aspect. That's an important aspect. Yeah? So that's why there were some times where you had an executive and they had to say, do I have RPA? Yes, check. Do I have process mining? Yes, check. Anything AI, something, something, something? Yes, check. And then the next year was, how many bots do you have? Oh, shit, I have only, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I only have uh, 200 bots. Oh, no, let's build up another center of excellence and then we do addition. Yeah. I was never about that part. Yeah. So I, I, never, I never valued my responsibility. How big is my COE? Do I have a COE or stuff like that? Right. Mm -hmm. this, it doesn't matter. You know, no man is omen. And the important part is can you deliver consistently outcomes? Mm -hmm. And it is true. Often they are purely financial. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't have to like it, but I still have to deliver it. And uh, we continuously uh, delivered on that. And uh, yes, through the use of putting different technologies together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah, that's super interesting to to have your how should I say it human centric financial process oriented view onto the world of business. <laughs> that's that's super cool. Taking all this uh, experience. Yeah. What would be your 
top three recommendations to our listeners to get to more human-centric BPM, to inspire people for processes, to rethink processes? Again, I can I can repeat it. Yeah, and we have it on, on record. Anyone, please contact me. I will listen to your situation, your context, and I will give you personalized top three recommendations after I listen to your story. Okay, yeah? that's an offer. And of course, there will be there will be some uh, that's a common uh, things. But I think uh, uh, maybe if I can uh, share one of my my favorite quotes, yeah, and it is uh, science provides an understanding of a universal experience, and arts provide a universal understanding of a personal experience. Yeah, and that quote came from uh, uh, Mae Jameson, first African American female astronaut, and I think it is really true. So we can have the theory, which is true and relevant, mm -hmm. just as averages are right. The average German drinks X liters of beer, eats X kilograms of chocolate. But you will find not one single person in the world who fits that. Mm -hmm. But statistically speaking, that is right. And that is really also, just to share you maybe without saying the names, I'm also working with social organizations, community organizations. So process management is extremely important for them because they need to be able to provide a standardized service. But once someone is affected, disability, accidents, or whatever. It's a one human they need to serve. <laughs> and they understand if one human is impacted, it always impacts the entire community. Yeah, that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for, for these recommendations and especially for the offer of contacting you to, to get personalized recommendations. That's super cool. So how can our listeners contact you, learn more about your activities? I guess probably the easiest way is uh, LinkedIn. You know, mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, you will probably include my info anyway sure. in a podcast uh, or just really follow the hashtag the T with T. So it's a T E A, a drink with T, T H I, my name. And yeah, you can really message me. I, I probably won't be able to reply always uh, immediately, but I will actually always reply. And yeah, so that's probably the easiest way to find me. Yeah, I'll put the links into the show notes and I can definitely recommend to follow your videos, Tea with Tea. That's super inspiring and always a lot of food for thought, I, I would say. So that, that's super cool. Keep on going with this great video series. That's just amazing. One last content-related question here. What would you recommend uh, to me or to the community to have a closer look onto like methodology, a tool, an expert to get new ideas on how to rethink processes? Wh whom or what would you recommend? I think, to be honest, in a generic way, anything what you don't know yet. <laughs> so be curious <laughs> and uh, learn about something new, I guess. Because if it wasn't for you, at least you know one less thing in the universe. I was talking to a rocket scientist uh, uh, earlier. Well, not rocket scientist, to a professor of uh, um, astro astronauts and all of these uh, things. Yeah, so send the satellites and rockets up there. Yeah. And he told me, for example, about the V-shape method, you know, how you come from the top, you break it down into little parts, and then you have to recompose it back. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah? In, in systems engineering, I never heard about that. So that was really, really interesting. But if you really want to not invest in any technology tool, subscription or whatever, there's a really, really cool tool which we have, and this is our two ears. We have one mouth. <laughs> so listen and then talk and yeah so it's it, it does drain a lot of energy by the way it's actually easier to talk than to listen and i think one guidance in terms of content i can give is which is of course it's an extreme hard thing i don't want to say that it's easy but i just want to make aware again it's it's so so normal and we should know it but the biggest challenge we have is actually between correlation and causality mm -hmm. yeah so for example It's very correlated when it rains, the road is wet. But it doesn't mean when the road is wet, it must have rained. You know, somebody could have also put some water out there, right? And this is something, this search, this kind of discovery, what is correlated? Technology can help us very, very well. How is it? What's the causality? You know, how's the context in that sense of the content? Well, that's harder, but that's what, what honestly, what I'm, I'm uh, passionate about. And yeah, so really be, I mean, it sounds so, so uh, Instagram, but uh, be curious, but also do it. Yeah. And I think one of the, the episodes I did on T with T was like, we have mastered the three R's, right? We have mastered uh, uh, re, reduce, 
reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. But I said, unfortunately, only on social media. We reduce the quality of our content. We have reused other people's content over and over and over. I don't know how many times I have to read the same article from MIT and Harvard Business Review. I mean, it's great articles, but where is your own content? Mm -hmm. what, what makes you, you? Yeah. And recycling the thing. You know, I, I honestly, I really love Simon Sinek, but I, I can't listen to it anymore because everyone talks about it and no one does anything about it. Yeah. And I think uh, this was also a little bit of the topic of the Eine neue Sau durchs Dorf treiben is I love these things and some of them didn't turn out great. Yeah. So yes, I, I really, I literally researched into K-pop bands to understand they are metaverse for many, many years already. Incredible. Okay. And they really understand what it means to have product lifecycle management forever. Basically, long story short, so there's a girl group of four girls and they have four avatars and they even go on tour separately. Amazing. Avatars okay. never age. Don't have contracts to breach. Yeah. That is metaverse. They go on tour and you're looking at a hologram. I was like, wow, people pay money for that. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the fan base changes, right? I, I learned from my daughter, Vocaloid, you know, how can you sing songs about suicide? Well, how about an AI voice? Because that voice is allowed to do that. And then you have the, the rigging on YouTube and, and, the, and the VTubers and stuff like that. I think it's amazing. Is it a fad? Yeah, it was. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, I think whatever new comes there, be curious, test it out. And I'm not talking about two minutes. Uh, that's why the same thing Business process management is was very sluggish. I mean, I am also myself a certified RS modeler back in the days. Yeah, I, I used <laughs> these things for many, many years. Yeah? I sit in a room listening to Professor Doctor Sher when he was only a doctor. Yeah, and I was there and I listening to him, and sometimes it seemed a little bit dry, but he was right, and he's yeah. still right. Yeah, not about the how and everything, but about the what and the why. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. the how is very, very interesting on how we can get. There, yeah, but um, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's basically my two cents. I was but rambling again, but <laughs> thanks for your patience on that one. <laughs> for sure, it's super inspiring. And normally, uh, I would now ask you before we leave the aircraft, right? We are already at the end of this episode, which we landed smoothly. Is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners, which we haven't talked about yet? So yeah, I mean, first of all, I really uh, thank you for taking the time. I think we often forget that it is still the ultimate and most precious thing there is. And it's also the most humbling one because as long as we don't have time machines, <laughs> it is as it is. And Elon Musk or whoever, Warren Buffett, they also only have 24 hours. So maybe that does not, that fact does not make us the richest person in the world, but the wealthiest nonetheless. And some people say, you know, you only live once. That's also BS, right? You live every day. You just die once. So I think really we make the most of every day on that. Yeah. So that's right. You know, focus on time. There's nothing you can reverse. Until I mean, we have time machines. So that's a good thing. That's why I also have jobs. But I think this is really the ultimate, most precious thing. It's time. Yeah. Super cool. So inspiring. Thanks a lot for all your thoughts, T. Just final question. How would you describe your flight experience with just three words? I'm bad at math, but let's do it again. <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. Cool. So thank you so much for being my guest on New Process Podcast. I'm looking forward to what is coming up next so and maybe i'm going to contact you as well to ask for three uh, individual personalized recommendations <laughs> so thank you so much why not have a great day Everyone's bye -bye. Welcome. you too thank you let's recap today's new process inspiration wow what a broad range of insights i really appreciate these human-centric process-oriented and finance-related view on business process management so i think What sticks most with me is his approach to listening first, asking better questions, and then talking as the last activity. And therefore, I really love his tool recommendation to use our two ears and our mouths, but first listen and then talk. So, And as he offered, if you'd like to try it out, 
feel free to contact Tim. He will then listen and afterwards give his personalized recommendations to you. I'll put the link to his LinkedIn profile into the show notes so it's easy for you to contact him. That's it for today. In the next episode, I'm going to recap the learnings from my search for a human-centric BPM tool. So if you are interested in finding out if I really found a human-centric BPM tool or not, then stay tuned. Otherwise, other interesting episodes are coming up, expert interviews, and maybe also some more tool interviews afterwards. But for now, thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Bye-bye and auf Wiedersehen. You've been listening to the New Process Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode for more tools, methods, and best practices to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Next level. Thank you for listening. Before you leave, as you might know, I'm doing a lot of research on how to rethink processes and how to get people excited for processes. So if you would like to find out more on how to do that for your own process, then I can recommend to you to download my free new process checklist, which is available on newprocesslab.com slash checklist. So just go there and download the file and then rethink your process. So have a great day. Bye-bye.